Hi, everybody. Welcome to another film about pigeons around the world. And welcome to our Pacific Communications Pigeon Film Archives. Actually, it's a basement, a basement office, but down here we have video and photos and documents from about 50 years of collecting of things about pigeons and film production of more than a dozen movies. At the end of this story, I'll tell you more about this and how you can access many of the stories we're going to tell and ones we've told. But first, pigeon racing down under. Earlier this year, I was delighted to be asked to visit Australia as part of a fundraising weekend put on by the Sydney Pigeon Fanciers. Now, getting invited is one thing. Getting there is another. From Montana to Sydney is over 8,000 miles, twice as far as going to Europe. So you give up about 24 hours easily each way just to make the trek. But no matter, it was worth every minute. I not only met some of the nicest pigeon folks on the planet, but as you will see, racing down under was an eye-opener, even for me after all these years of filming pigeon people and their lofts in Asia, Europe, and in North America. Basically, when you go there in one day, you go from one season to another, actually two seasons. It's all upside down. In my case, from a chilly, snowy spring in North America to a balmy, sunny fall in Sydney. Flying in to Australia and Sydney, you realize what a beautiful place this is. Australia is about the size of the lower 48 states, almost 3 million square miles. But what is dramatically different is the amount of coastline and desert. Three relatively warm oceans surround Australia, which has over 16,000 miles of ocean coastline, roughly three times that of the USA. But 70% of the country is the outback, basically desert, where only 3% of Australia's 25 million people live. Everybody lives on the coast. And to me, flying into Sydney felt like going to California. Beaches, breaking waves, tropical trees, and lush vegetation. It's a straight 14-hour non-stop hop from Los Angeles to Sydney. Luckily, I got some sleep. Because from the moment I was met by pigeon fancier Anthony Aegeus, Big Tony as they call him, we were on our way to my first pigeon event. We drove south for about an hour through a huge national park along the coast. I could look through the trees and see the breaking waves. And we were gonna attend a special lunch in Wollongong to honor one of Australia's most famous pigeon racers, Graham Davidson, or in the parlance of the Aussies here, Davo. But really I only had two holidays in my life because I don't like going away and leaving someone to look after the pigeons. But it's a lot of work and I spend all day, every day here. Although he's retired and not racing because of diminished health, Graham and his wife June are beloved by the folks here. And because of his years of racing and writing about his methods, he's literally changed the racing sport in Australia, as you will see. Graham had an unbroken string of shipping to races. 37 years without a miss. And you have to realize how good a partner June is when you hear that Davo was late for his own wedding because he was waiting for a pool bird to time in. I kid you not. Pigeon history in the late 1800s in Australia mirrors that in the United States in many ways. In the 1880s, Australian fanciers were importing Belgian and European birds from racing legends such as England's Northrop Barker, and the development of rail, of railroad transportation, helped allow races to extend over farther and farther distances. That's exactly what was happening in America. But then something unprecedented happened that changed the bloodlines of the birds here. In 1956, the Australian government executed a total ban on the importation of pigeons and many other birds from outside Australia. They were trying to protect native species that hadn't been exposed to many of these outside birds and diseases, etc. So for decades of racing, all of the pigeons here were in this isolated bubble. And over time, the base European bloodlines became a true Australian strain, especially good at long distance. This is the racing history older fanciers like Davo grew up with. They could only dream about what top European birds could do for them, 
But for the younger fanciers today, the game changed dramatically because in 1990, the government finally created a quarantine system and the importation ban was lifted. So the old Australian strains were once again mixed with the imports from the best of Europe. Imagine over 40 years without any new blood coming in. Pretty amazing. Now the warm Sydney weather was a wonderful change for me and with lots of jet lag to contend with, I got a lot of chance to walk around at all hours of the day and night and get a feel for Australia's largest city. I didn't have a car, but was kindly shuttled around the event site and around Sydney by Paul Gibbs and his wife, Helen. Paul's a racer from the north of Australia, and he also helped me create a cross-section of fanciers to visit in the days following the fundraiser. The event where I spoke was located in a large meeting room adjoining a Greyhound racing track. Now down here they have dog and horse tracks in Sydney, as well as big social clubs where many of the pigeon clubs meet and ship their birds. In the United States, we know of motor neuron disease as Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS. The event was conceived by Phil Murphy, and all of the proceeds from booth rentals and an online and live pigeon auction went towards motor neuron research. It's a disease that has tragically touched a lot of fanciers' families here. Another invited guest was Dutch champion Marcel Sangers, who came with his wife Christelle and was also enjoying the warm weather south of the equator. We are on the podium in addition to some top Australian presenters for the big convention day and auction. As you can see, the convention was a hit and it was a gas to meet face to face with fanciers who've been watching my movies for years. People couldn't have been nicer. For me, one of the day's highlights was the auction run by a fancier from Victoria, John Shore. By day, he's one of the country's top realtors, but in his free time for over 40 years, John has raised millions of dollars for charity auctions. So he's a very dedicated pigeon man, but so respected, he recently received the coveted Medal of the Order of Australia. That's established by Queen Elizabeth. It's the country's highest service award. One interesting thing here is there is no national Australian pigeon organization. Dozens of clubs and their federations make up the sport and issue bans on July 1st each year. And I was told there are about 8,000 flyers in a population of 25 million. That's one pigeon racer per every 3,000 people, a little less than half the per capita membership in the UK, but about six times the ratio in the USA. The enormous success of the Saturday fundraiser was followed by a lunch and afternoon on Sunday at the home and lofts of Pat Arcella. Pat's another highly respected and successful businessman who's devoted to the pigeon sport. And Marcel and I got the grand tour from Pat and I was finally beginning to not feel any jet lag as I said goodbye to Paul and Helen and got ready for several days of loft visits. Now Paul Gibbs did a brilliant job of picking a truly diverse group of Sydney fanciers for me to visit. I'm sorry I didn't get to go to Melbourne and Perth and all the other places, but there's a real cross section here. And after he headed home, it was Phil Murphy, finally relaxing after running the big event, who was my first day guide. In the profiles to come, you'll realize Australia has as diverse a pigeon crew as anywhere I know. Sure, they speak English, but the variety of immigrants who've come here and brought their love of pigeons is incredible. But some didn't even bring a love with them, they found it here. Now imagine a pigeon fancier, a champion, who is not only a Thai immigrant, but is also a woman. A professional hairdresser who caught a pigeon in a Sydney park on her lunch hour and incredibly went on to dominate racing here within a decade. Meet Poi Winton. Poi and her husband have recently returned to the sport for a number of years before she decided to take a break. Poi was a nightmare for the men she raced against in Sydney. An example, they have a race for a car down here, and from 2000 to 2003, Poi won it three times. And like many champions, there's not much room in her house for her trophies. Now, Poi is a gentle and humble person and does virtually everything in the loft on her own. She scrapes her entire loft each day and also uses a propane burner to kill any bugs or germs that are on the surface. Poi immigrated to Sydney when she was 25, some 30 years ago. She already had family in the area and worked as a hairdresser, but she knew absolutely nothing about pigeons. Here's her story. I 
work in the salon in Kogara and it's my lunch break, so to go out, sit down in the park and have your lunch. The bird wants some food and I give them some food and I see one bird, one pigeon got the ring. Had you ever seen that before? No. I got, I've got to come back on Sunday that I'm not working, you know, and see if they were still here because I have to go back to work, I can't do anything. So I come back on Sunday with the bird seed, you know, and it doesn't take that long. That bird is there. So I put it near my feet, you know, and I grabbed it. And then I look around. <laughs> no one look at me. <laughs> I take in my car and drive home. But that's how it started. After she snuck away with that pigeon, she looked up some pigeon people, made friends, learned about racing, and started to buy imports from Europe. The rest is history. She was soon at the top of the race results where she stayed for many years. I had many fanciers ask me if I'd met Poi because so many fanciers in Sydney like and respect her for her achievements. If having a woman among the top flyers here is noteworthy, so is the average age of many of the fanciers I met. A great example is Paul Vasallo, who Phil and I visited the next day. A tile installer in the building trade, Paul is not yet out of his 30s, but has already achieved a stunning record, winning Federation Flyer of the Year three years running here in Sydney. Like Poi, Paul demonstrates that unique skill of having a loft full of tame pigeons. They may fly like the wind, but here at home, they're relaxed and scrambling for their trainer's attention. Paul's lofts are tucked into his parents' back garden in an older neighborhood. He's won dozens of races from this spot and has several interesting tricks. One thing I liked was how he keeps his droppers in a separate nest box, just away from his landing board. He can pull out a dropper, let it fly to the board, then the bird will fly back to its nest box, ready for another round. Very smart. And like several top fanciers I spoke with, Paul is determined to keep his birds hydrated. From the time they can first drink, they do so in baskets placed at the front of the loft. The same type of baskets they're shipped to in races, so they grow totally accustomed to drinking whenever they need to. These small details are what wins races. The birds never ever drink from inside the race loft, from when I wean them till the only time they ever drink and is when I start racing and I have the, the hallway set for just the race birds to come home but that's the only time I'll put a, a hopper inside for them to drink. They always learn how to drink from that basket. It becomes habit, not just in their comfort zone at home. Sydney is the most populous city in Australia with just under five million people. The sun, the coast, and the vegetation really do feel like California. And we all know the story of Botany Bay, where for almost 50 years, England sent shiploads of convicts to live and work and settle in Australia. What's ironic is these shipments didn't start until 1778. That's two years after the American Revolution. Before that, thousands of convicts had been sent to America, but that stopped when the USA won independence. Somehow Chesapeake Bay in America didn't get stigmatized the way Botany Bay did, but thus is history. Now Sydney's a vibrant, bustling city, and I had several nice visits with Sydney's pigeon fraternity during my stay. What I did not realize is how diverse the fancier group is. There are obviously many with English roots, but also there's many Italians, Middle Easterners, and a lot of descendants of fanciers on Malta. It's as varied a pigeon culture as I've seen anywhere. It was fun to run the drone with these guys and show them their lofts the way their birds see them. They never got tired of looking at my little monitor as we were flying around. In addition to the dozens of greyhound racing tracks in New South Wales, Sydney has four horse racing tracks. At one of these tracks, I visited Gary Portelli, one of the top horse trainers in Australia. With millions of dollars in wins for the horses under his care, Gary races primarily at Warwick Farm in the southwestern part of the city. You can imagine the stress of a job caring for, training, and conditioning thoroughbreds worth millions of dollars. Gary was being interviewed on the radio when I visited, and he showed me around his Portelli stables. So, what does a top professional horse trainer do when he needs to unwind from the stress of big-time horse racing? 
How about pigeon racing? We've had yarns over the years and more recently about your great success and your champion Philly that won the golden slipper shoe will reign. But I don't know that you're as enthusiastic about the golden <laughs> slipper as you are about the pigeon. <laughs> well, I've got to say, winning the All Age Derby this year against some of the best flyers in Australia here was, was up there with, I feel, uh, winning a golden slipper. So there you go. Hidden behind the horse stables, Gary and his father have a set of pigeon lofts and race every week in Sydney. Now, Gary said that sometimes he will have a horse race on a weekend so that his dad will stay by the loft waiting for arrivals. I think it's wonderful that the sport here has a spokesman who is famous for winning horse races but can then explain to the public how he enjoys and respects our feathered athletes just as much as this expensive horse flesh. I find that the pigeons are much more intricate to train than the racehorses, to tell you the truth. There's so many different variables with the birds, you know, we've, we've got situations where you've got, you, you've got to know the weather on the weekend. How fast are they going to fly? What's the wind going to be? Where's it going to be in their, fr their face? Is it going to be on their side? Is it going to be behind them? Another visit was to the loft of Greg McLaughlin. Now it's always enjoyable to see how loft designs vary from continent to continent. Down here, summer is at Christmas time. People go to the beach after they open their presents. And winter, which is from June through August, can be very mild. So they race their pigeons in Australia in winter, when the average daytime temps are in the high 60s, but at night in the mid 40s. And that affects some of their loft design, which we'll get to in a second. Greg and Johnny Deberkat, who also was one of my guides, explained how they race down here around the clock, which is basically releasing from different points on the compass each year to even out the competition between differing loft locations. At the moment, we're out the west part of Sydney, up here at Berkshire Park. It's close to Windsor and Richmond. We've, we race a northwest route, a west route, a southwest, and a south route, and north along the coast. Getting towards the end of the cycle, we'll, we'll vote on where our next uh, cycle is, is going to start and finish and how many years we will have in that cycle. The whole Federation votes on that. What's also fascinating is they race all of their birds, young and old, at the same time. There aren't separate old and young bird seasons. Now because of this mild climate, the lofts are very open for maximum ventilation. Johnny and I visited Greg McLaughlin toward the end of my stay and his loft is a perfect example. Greg's been on the top of the charts for years, and like a lot of local lofts, he's very careful to keep his race team from getting chilly. He built the loft on a slab of concrete with heating cables built in. There's, there's 132 metres of heating cable under the concrete, and the, the cable was put in attached to the Rio before the concrete was laid. Uh, with the, the heated floor, the, the air circulates extremely well, so the, the air is fresh in the loft and maintained a uh, consistent uh, temperature at all times. Now this was combined with metal shutters, really a cool idea. With the heat on inside, he can lower the shutters on the front of the loft and keep the interior temperature at a higher level. And this keeps his birds from losing form. Greg also mentioned another important safety tip he took when he thought his birds were suffering from bad water collecting in the loft gutters. The front of the loft, I have um, some cones in the gutter so the water doesn't uh, sit there. Previous years I've had um, problems with giardia, giardia, with water being in the gutter. The water goes down. <laughs> it goes down and the water runs out into the paddock. The longer I was in Australia, the more things sort of looped back to my very first sit down within hours of my arrival with Graham Davidson. It's fair to say that many fanciers see him as the father of modern racing in Australia. And Davo's openness about his methods, both one-on-one -on -one with other fanciers and through his writings and his videos, made his system something that fit the bill for a huge number of fanciers who fly in the big Sydney and Melbourne federations. A perfect example is the loft and methods of Jason Stig, who's been at the top for many years in one of Sydney's strongest and largest pigeon clubs. Jason's loft was a definite Davo model, like several I'd seen with the same characteristics. In particular, a centralized landing board where the birds trap in and come down onto a feeding table. 
and he was kind enough to explain many of the tricks Devo developed that made him such a consistent champion. Uh, I had this built, loft built in 2005 uh, with Graham Devo, his help. He uh, helped me design the loft. Jason also showed me his heated concrete floor and his shutters, and he explained several more of Devo's ideas, such as brainwashing. It's an Australian thing from, uh, it was originated for Graham Davison or Davo. It's a thing we call the brainwashing system. Probably takes a week or 10 days where we'll train the birds and we'll toss them simultaneously after training and we'll reduce the feed each day. So by the end of the week, we've pretty much got them on a string. They, my birds here, when I've got them going, they don't circle. Sometimes they'll come over the back of the loft from one of these tosses, they'll backflip in the air straight in. This is really a clever loft design with easily moved wire partitions that make loading pigeons a real time saver. And again, like you saw earlier, outside baskets teach the youngsters exactly how to drink in the transporter. Lots of attention to detail down here, lots of very logical design. I hope you learn from this. What is heartwarming to me is that even though Devo can no longer race, younger fanciers still religiously follow his clever methods. Another good example is Johnny Debrincat, a wonderful young man who took over from Phil in showing me around. Now like Jason, Johnny spent hours with Graham asking about his methods and also modeled his loft on the master's concepts. He's a legend in Australia. And so basically this loft come from his design, him and Jason Stig. Johnny took the moving shutter idea even further by installing a push button system. Get this, he can raise and lower these shutters, these breathable shutters from his living room. He's just very generous and you know, and he's, he loves the pigeon games and he wants to see it continue and he's very helpful and helps a lot of people, a lot of new starters. He just wants to see the game go on. I was lucky enough to meet him in a seminar in 2011 and he gave me his phone number which was really nice and he said to me, if you ever need any help just don't hesitate to call me. He gave me birds which are now my best pigeons I have. So many people um, look up to him and they know he's a good flyer and yeah, it's really great. I was lucky, so lucky to have met him. Sadly, it was too short a visit. But those are a few of the wonderful pigeon people I got to visit here in Sydney. What a diverse group. A Thai immigrant, a famous horse trainer, some very young yet successful fanciers, and dozens of folks who have enjoyed our movies. It was an honor to be invited and to help this group with their goals. Thanks to Phil, John Shore, and all the donors and helpers, we raised well over $40,000 for motor neuron disease. And in the end, like good pigeon people everywhere, they have a few guiding lights, like Graham Davidson, Davo. They immediately tell you about him. They want a newcomer to know. Because yes, this game is about winning, but also in the end, it's also about the friendships that transcend ethnic backgrounds and generations, because we all share a love for our wonderful homing pigeons. I'm Jim Jenner. Thanks for watching Pigeon Racing Down Under.